بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله الله اكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا اله الا الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Rahman Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most gracious most merciful Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala ibadihi alladhina astafa All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all Amin Honored ulama beloved brothers and sisters before we commence this evening, I have a small request for everyone to move forward, inshallah. If the brothers in the first saf could move a little bit more forward, because there are many people outside standing, that side where the wudu is made and on this particular side where the shoes are as well. Please, can we all come forward and then the brothers outside can come inside, inshallah. I have chosen to speak on a very important and crucial topic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us acceptance. It is not easy to select topics to speak on. But I feel that we ask Allah something that has been in my heart throughout my trip this time. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who can utter words from the heart to the heart for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will never attack individuals. No. But if someone feels they are being attacked directly, it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Allah knows what my condition is, what your condition is. The Quran is a powerful book. The Sunnah is a powerful lifestyle, the most powerful. What is mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah deals with my weakness as a human being and yours. So there will definitely be verses in the Quran that will tackle you below the belt. May Allah protect us. And I don't wish to let you know what the topic is, but as I am speaking, it will come to you, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors for all of us. I am addressing myself, and you are just listening to what I am saying, in that I will be thinking aloud. That's the best way of putting it. My dearest brothers and sisters in Islam, we know that when we have something wrong with our bodies physically, we visit the doctor. We know that the doctor then tells us the do's and the don'ts and depending on how serious the sickness is, we adopt exactly what the doctor says in order to come out of that problem. Those who have big sicknesses, let me give you an example. Sugar, may Allah grant shifa and cure to all those who, who are suffering that problem. Those who have a, a sugar problem, where it fluctuates, they know that as soon as you put something sweet in your mouth, the effect runs through your whole body. As soon as that happens. Those who might have, for example, a different type of a problem, say a migraine, they know that there is a certain tablet, when I put it in my mouth, within half an hour, I will feel better. Those who don't have energy, they know that if I have Supradin or Baruka or something of that nature, within a little while I'll feel okay. Now the question I have is that when something of a physical nature has an effect on our physical health, do you think that if we were to put into our mouths things that were spiritually detrimental for us, that it would not have an effect on our spirituality. Wallahi, within split seconds, we will feel the spiritual effect as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has drawn our attention to this in the Quran as well as in the Sunnah. Be careful what you eat. 
Be careful not only what you eat, that it must be halal, but to go a step further, that the money you use to buy those items must also be halal. Make sure your earnings are pure and clean because if they are not going to be of the purest level, they will add spiritual cholesterol to destroy yourself spiritually. And the impact is quicker than the impact of a panado or two, the impact of superadine or the impact of sugar when you have low sugar. It's quicker and faster and much more far reaching. They say some of these sicknesses are hereditary. Believe me, these spiritual sicknesses are also hereditary. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. Allah speaks about the spiritual upliftment of the family of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. And Allah says, Progeny, one after the other. Family, one after the other. They are following suit. May Allah protect us. Why? The father was interested in Allah. The children will also be interested in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On condition that there is nothing between the two that resulted in the contamination of the latter. What that means is, the father can be as holy as he wants, but if his income is not pure, it firstly affects his progeny. And it will affect his offspring. Let me take you right back to the beginning. Adam alayhi salatu was salam committed a sin. We know that. I want to take you to the effect as soon as he ate. What happened? You know it and I know it, but I don't think we've actually thought about it. The first thing that happened is shamelessness. That is what happens when you eat one morsel of haram, when you have rice that is purchased with funds that are questionable, you become shameless and your children become shameless and your private parts are the first to be affected. Allahu Akbar. That's a fact of life. So it's better not to eat and to remain hungry than to put one morsel of something questionable into your mouth. And when we say your private parts are the first to be affected, let me inform you. Adam alayhi salatu was salam. The first thing that happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Badat lahuma sawatuhuma. Their private parts became exposed. They were covered. They became exposed. Shamelessness. And that's what will happen to myself and yourselves. Before I move further, let me quickly clarify a point. Because we should not have any form of ill feeling for Adam alayhi salatu was salam. Why? Because before that shamelessness could overtake him, he regretted. And he began to look for some leaves to cover himself. We know that. They began to look for the cover. To cover themselves, so they regretted immediately. That is why the hadith says, "Ida sarratka hasanatuka wasaatka sayyatuka fa anta mu'min." When your good deed makes you happy and your bad deed makes you regret, then you are a true mu'min, inshallah. But if Adam alayhi salatu was salam did not engage in tawbah and if he did not regret, shamelessness would have overtaken him and everybody after him. May Allah protect us all. Allah says in the Quran, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى ثُمَّ جِتَبَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ وَهَدَى Allah says, Adam alayhi salam committed a sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was heading in the wrong direction, but Allah chose him so he quickly came back. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of the beautiful words. Allah says, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِن رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was communication between him and Adam alayhi salam, so Allah forgave Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. And the words Adam alayhi salam and his wife, 
our mother, Hawa alayha salatu was salam said, Rabbana, O oh Allah, O oh our Rabb, O oh the one who has given us life, Zalamna anfusana, we have oppressed ourselves, we have done wrong, we really have done wrong. If you are not going to forgive us, if you are not going to have mercy on us, then we will be from amongst the losers. We will be from amongst those who are destroyed, Allah is saying. Subhanallah. What happened to his private parts? They remained exposed forever and so are ours yet before they were not. So the effect of that haram remained up to today in us. Subhanallah. Though he was forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, if, the, if one of the first or the first of creation, meaning of man, the first of man could have such a powerful, solid, great, massive impact upon having one bite of haram, Tell me when we are eating bags and bags of 50 kilos of rice every single day. What is happening to our children? What is happening to us? We are contaminated from the top to the bottom, from the side to the other side. And our children and our progeny for generations to come, the genes within us are also becoming haram. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us hunger rather than eating from haram. Really. And yet we cheat each other daily. We crook each other. We lie to each other. We deceive each other in business. We eat interest like it's no man's business. We call it anything we want. We call it investment. We call it whatever we want. Wallahi, interest is interest and it will remain haram until the day of Qiyamah. And it will continue having a negative impact on those who devour it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all acceptance. And may He protect us from haram. So if we have not gone into the depth of just that one verse, we have really not done justice to our own sustenance. Subhanallah. Think about the impact of one bite of haram and what happened and how this skittle effect reached us today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. So when we are born, we will be born out of nature, sinless, completely spotless, but physically, and sometimes spiritually, we would have suffered because of what our parents did. A person who is on drugs and heavily on drugs, look at their offspring. There is a great chance from amongst them, what would have happened? You will find defects. You will find children who are incomplete. You will find the chromosomes instead of 23 were 22. So the one organ is missing and that is happening. May Allah protect all of us and our offspring. And may He grant us protection from drugs. The moment, and to be honest with you, the exact moment that you find, the exact moment, subhanallah, the exact moment that you find a person eating haram, that is the moment they effect their reproductive system. First thing. One might ask, but no, our children are innocent. Why should children pay for the parents' deeds? I want to let you know something. Allah speaks about it. And he says, Family, progeny, one after the other, like father, like son. If father is known for robbery and thuggery, unless Allah's mercy overtakes a, a youngster, he probably will have it in his genes and he will need, he will need to engage in tawbah and to change the road and the course like Ibrahim alayhi salam. He had a father who was an idol worshiper. But when Allah gave him understanding, he questioned that. And he says, Oh my father, I have knowledge that came to me that did not come to you. So follow me and I will show you what the right path is. If he did not do that, he was also going to be the same carving idols and he was going to be cursed in the same way. So this is why it is very, very important that we realize that if a person has drugs, for example, and if a person's drug taking affects and has an impact on the children, then do we think spirituality is not going to affect them? Do we think spirituality is not going to affect them? Imagine if taking something affected a person physically. Do you think spirituality doesn't? The father never read Salah. Do you think the children automatically will begin to read Salah from day one? Unless Allah grants them guidance after they reach a certain age by their struggle to find the truth. 
That is the only time that they will be able to look for it. Otherwise, if they live within their, their own environment, do you know what the hadith says? مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا وَيُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ That's the power of the parents. The hadith says, every child is born upon nature. But as they grow up, their parents either make them Jews or make them Christians or make them Muslims. As they grow up, subhanallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us all. So if the, if the impact of the parents is recognized in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, nay, when that child reaches the age of puberty, we open a new account with them. Now they are responsible for their own deeds. Now they must go out and hunt for the truth. This is why Islam is a religion that does not discourage questions. No. Ask whatever questions you want. You don't understand something? Ask in a nice, polite manner. Not to defy the truth, but to try and understand it. And you, it is not wrong to keep on asking the same question to many people until you feel that you've now understood what it is. I have had youngsters who come to me and say, why do we have to read Salah? We are reading Salah, but we want to know why. How does it help us? And I'm sure they may have asked that question to many people. Islam does not discourage that question because when you know, you will now read Salah with full conviction. Rather than when you don't know, you might just be reading it as a duty. May Allah make us from amongst those who are reading it. Whether you consider it just a duty without understanding or whether you understand it. Because some of us, we don't even read it. Neither this way nor that way. And then we want to call ourselves Muslims. So, one morsel of haram, the first thing it does, shamelessness. And if there is tawbah before you have the rest of your children, inshallah, you will be able to deal with that by coming back. But there might be some form of effect that will last a long time, like with Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. And when we say halal, I'm not only talking of the animal that was slaughtered in the proper manner. No, more deep than that is how did you earn your money? Who are you working for? What type of money came into your possession? What has happened? What type of dealing did you do? You might be selling, mashallah, halal things, but you conned the consumer, you conned your customer, you lied to him one lie, you've contaminated your wealth. It's a fact of life. Why did we do that? Why lie? Why cheat? Why deceive? Why cheat? Really, it, it does not pay us at all. Because baraka lies in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The blessings in that wealth is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd rather be a person who has less but full of blessings and happiness than a person and how many of them they are who have the millions and the billions but they need to have sleeping pills in order to get a wink of sleep. Why? No contentment, no baraka. I am not saying such a person's wealth is haram but I am definitely saying such a person should look into why they cannot sleep. May Allah grant us good health. And may Allah grant us halal sustenance. May Allah grant us baraka in our sustenance. So it is a very important topic. It is so important that it affects every single human being. Let me take it a step further. When a person eats haram, what happens? Let's take it now beyond just, just the shamelessness. Because I told you, it, shamelessness will overtake a person until and unless they engage in tawbah and repent from their bad ways and habits. If they have repented, Allah turns a new leaf for them. When a man cuts his hand, let me give you a different example, because not none of us are just going to cut our hands. When a Muslim person tattoos his forehead with a permanent tattoo, writing the name of his girlfriend on there, what happens? He earns the curse of Allah, that is shameless behavior. But if he engages in tawbah, is there a chance that Allah will forgive him? Yes, there is, definitely. As soon as he says, Ya Allah, forgive me, I made a mistake, I'll never do it again. He's forgiven. But what will happen to that tattoo? It will remain with him until Qiyamah. Even on the day of Qiyamah, may Allah protect us. If Allah wills and his tawbah was genuine, it might not be there. But if his tawbah was not genuine, it may still be there. So why I am saying this is to prove to you that sometimes we've done certain things in our lives that have already had such an impact that is irreversible in one way, but reversible in another way. When a person tattoos their forehead, 
with a permanent tattoo, most probably they won't be able to take it out. But in the eyes of Allah, they may be forgiven. This is why when you see Muslims who walk into the masjid with big tattoos, don't give them dirty looks. The fact that they've walked into the masjid is already a sign. Subhanallah. It's already a sign. But let's go beyond that. When a person engages in tawbah, they wipe out the past. If something has already occurred before they engaged in tawbah, there's a chance that they will have to live with that sickness for a long, long time. May Allah grant us all protection. And if we take it a step further, we will realize that as you put rice in your mouth, you see, why am I saying rice? For a reason. The reason is I don't want to confuse you to think that we're only talking about haram chicken and haram meat. No, leave that on one side. That we expect everyone to be worried about it. Even the drunkards in the pub, they have a certificate there to say, is your meat halal? When a man is in the casinos, he'll go to the restaurant on the side and say, are your samosas halal? We know that. Why? It's something in the heart that tells you, make sure it's slaughtered properly. That for some reason Muslims are concerned about. What I've heard is there's a new generation of people, possibly coming from overseas, maybe and possibly from the Arab world, who have a total misunderstanding of what halal is. And they say, ah, kullu halal, everything is okay. Just eat, say bismillah and eat, whether it's here or there. Wallahi, for them, maybe even pork, they might think that when you say bismillah, you can eat. May Allah protect us. I hope there's none of us from amongst us here who think that. Because to be honest with you, you need to slaughter the animal and whilst the Muslim is slaughtering it, they need to utter the words. If they haven't uttered it at that time, it becomes questionable. May Allah protect us. So you can't delay the uttering of the Bismillah to the moment of eating. Otherwise, what's the point of having all the verses of halal and haram in the Quran if it was that simple? Allah says, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنَّهُ لَفِسْقَى Allah says, don't ever, don't you dare eat anything that the name of Allah is not mentioned upon because it is outside the fold of what is correct. Fisk means khuruj, to come out. It is out. It is unacceptable. So how can we then condone it? So we are not talking today about the chickens and the meat. I want to talk about rice because a lot of us, we eat the rice thinking this is halal, but how did you buy it? That's the question. What money did you use to buy it? It is reported that when you know that a man's income is haram, it becomes haram for you to go to his house to have a meal. Don't eat. And I think a lot of us are guilty of not even thinking of that. We go to anyone's house, we see, mashallah, the biryani. Hey, the dish is looking at us and the, the steam is piping, mashallah, up there. And the scent, the aroma is in our noses, mashallah. And the belly begins to call. And you just look and swipe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to digest our foods. It is reported that some of the ulama are so conscious of halal and haram that whenever they have gone and eaten that which appears halal, such as rice, which was purchased by haram funds, somehow miraculously they just vomited out after some time. It doesn't go into the system longer than a little while. And with us, we love food so much that we don't even think about it, not realizing that there is so much shamelessness in the community and society today, on the globe today. Do you know it is a direct result of haram income? Direct result. And we will never ever be able to restore shame in the communities. Unless we become very strict with what goes into our mouths. The reproductive system is the first to be affected from the time of Adam right up to today. Even the doctors will confirm with you. When you have a puff of tech, for example, the first thing it does to you is it messes up your reproductive system. That's the first thing. It takes years for one puff to come out of your system. So let's be careful. Now, if we take a look at how deep it goes, if we do not engage in Tawbah, when you are putting rice into your mouth, I was saying, your hands that have touched it, I'm not even going to go to the cooking part of it. Because it was earned through haram means, it was earned through cheating, through deceiving, through haram income. It was earned through 
having conned and connived and dirty means and tactics and so on. So your hands, these fingers are telling you, please don't touch this. It's not allowed for you. Please don't. Don't use me to touch this. It's like you, a thug, a big thug comes to you and says, listen, we need to murder that guy. You grab the gun. I show you how to pull the trigger. What will you say? Please don't make me do that. Don't make me do that. Then you, that man takes out a gun on you and says, shoot him or I'll shoot you. So you end up shooting him. Did you do it because you wanted to? No, you are not responsible. They forced you to do it. Agreed? Right. So what happens to our hands? We apply the same rule to our fingers. The finger is telling you, don't use me to eat this, please. I don't know. I don't want to burn in the fire. Don't use me. Don't you dare use me. And you impose it with a gun on your fingers and say, hey, I'm taking you. Why? That gun is your soul. Your soul is your choice. You think you own the body. Wallahi, these bodies we have don't belong to us. Wallahi al-Azim. They belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The choice is ours. Whether we want to use these bodies in the right direction or the wrong direction. The Quran says it clearly. That on the day of Tiyama, these organs that you thought were yours will bear witness against you. If they were really yours, they would never bear witness against you. And there are several verses in the Quran in that regard, including in Surah Yasin. Allah says, اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون. The exact issue I was talking about. Allah says on that day, we will seal their mouths. Their hands will speak to us and their legs will talk to us. Bear witness against them as to what they used to earn. Earn. Kasaba yaksibu means to earn. So the earnings of your hand, your hand will bear witness against you to say this was robbery. This is what it was. This man used me to consume haram. May Allah protect us. This man imposed on his family members to eat haram. Because we are the ones who put the plate of food in front of our wives and children. They are innocently eating. If you were having a, a say for example, a drink of water that was spiked intentionally by a family member of yours and you then suffered as a result, whose fault it is? Whose fault is it? Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So the hands are cursing us, but we entrap the hands and force it upon the fingers to actually put it into the mouth. As it is going through the lips, the lips are cursing us. Please don't put this through me. It might appear to be rice. It might appear to be biryani, but it's haram. It's not allowed. Then what happens? The tongue has enzymes. The enzymes are cursing us. The tongue is cursing us. It goes in. We are chewing. The teeth are cursing us. What do you want those teeth to do? Now you end up at the dentist and you want to spend money on your teeth. Those are the same teeth that will bear witness against you on the day of Qiyamah. You've been chewing haram. May Allah protect us. And I'm talking about food which we do not even think of that it could be haram. Why? Because of the way it was earned. The way it came to the plate. How did it find itself here? And then we take a look further. Let's go deeper than that. It goes through the esophagus, such a sophisticated organ. Subhanallah, the contraction and expansion of that results in the digestion or the downward movement of the food. Subhanallah, in little morsels. And yet with every contraction, we are cursed. With every expansion, we are cursed. And the food is going down. Then listen to what happens. Wallahi, it is deep and it is serious. Then it goes into the, the rest of the system, the small intestine, the big intestine, it gets right out of the rectum and even the rectum is cursing. Allahu Akbar. All the organs of the body are cursing us. But what is worse than that is that the nutrients that have now become a part of our bodies through that haram are with us forever. Do you know what the hadith says? Any portion of meat that has grown, any part of the body that has, has been a result of haram intake, haram ingestion, will never ever enter Jannah. It needs to go into Jahannam to burn out of your system first. Then only you can go into Jannah. That's how far it goes. Which means you've eaten it, the minerals that came out of it. 
the oxygenated blood from the liver that came out. Now the liver is contaminated, the kidneys are contaminated, the blood is contaminated. What happens thereafter? Everything is contaminated. Now your eyes are contaminated because the oxygenated blood circulates through your system. When you look, you look shamelessly. You see a woman on the street, you're not supposed to look at the fact that you've been already fed by haram. Your thinking is haram. Your eyes are haram. You end up looking there whether you like it or not. It's to do with your food. You've eaten wrong. Haram place. Automatically you start walking there. And you tell yourself, but I didn't want to do it. Correct your eating habits. Make sure you eat halal. Automatically, inshallah, that will help itself. If you are concerned about your food, that is why the biggest stressing in the Quran is for food and drink. Subhanallah. After those pillars of Islam. So many verses Allah says in the Quran, there is a whole surah called the laid tablecloth, a whole surah called the cattle, a whole surah called the cow, Allahu Akbar, a whole surah regarding the bee and the honey and so on. And how pure it is. So many times Allah mentions fish. So many times he mentions about not deceiving and not cheating and not stealing and not conning and conniving and so on. May Allah protect us. Now what happens? Everything we do is haram. The way we smell is haram. The way we taste is haram. When you want to listen, what do you now listen to? You listen to all the music. Why? You will justify it to say there's nothing wrong with this because your whole thinking is gone. It's contaminated with haram. This is nothing. It's minor. That's what we say. Why? Because we cannot think really because our morsels, we don't even know where they came from. May Allah forgive us all and grant us a new beginning. Really myself included. We don't even know sometimes what we are eating. It is reported regarding some of the, the ulama of old that whenever they used to go to someone's house whom they knew his piety and income, they ate more. Why? Because they knew this person is very pious. Let's eat from their food. So inshallah, we will achieve barakah because they, they had it in a proper way. And they earned it in a proper way. May Allah grant us just the ability to think about what is being said today. Now if we take a look deeper than that, let's go to the Quran. What does the Quran say about eating interests? Do you know what it says? What did I tell you moments ago? I told you that they can't think straight. Why? Because the oxygen that went into the brain was or was formed by that which was completely haram. Allah says, الذين يأكلون الربا لا يقومون إلا كما يقوم الذي يتخبطه الشيطان من المس. Allah says those who eat haram, those who eat interest. Allah says they do not behave in any other way than the behavior of a person who is totally possessed and mad. They do not behave in any other way besides the behavior of one who is possessed by the devil. As though the devil has turned them upside down by his possession. May Allah grant us understanding. So we need to think of this very carefully. When a person eats haram, it affects their brain, their capacity to think. This is why sometimes you might find a person appearing to be highly intellectual, highly intellectual, but, and a big but, you try to explain to them something very, very simple about the deen. They fail to understand. They will debate. They will argue. They will prove their point. They will try to prove their point. Why? Wallahi, ya akhi, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. If you are telling someone salah is farad and they are telling you, no, you only have to read two or three salah. Wallahi, you can turn the world upside down. You won't succeed. You only need to just try and carry on. Sometimes the brain is so contaminated. The Quran says they are, they behave like people who are totally possessed. There's the verse. I read it for you. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us the contamination of the entire system, the pollution of the whole universe and all its inhabitants if they were to eat haram. Today we are worried about the ozone layer. We are worried about gas emissions. 
We are not worried about spiritual carbon monoxide that is depleting the ozone of Jahannam, which is making it bigger and bigger with more and more inhabitants. May Allah protect us all. Really, that's what's going on today. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a firm understanding. Because if you look at the degradation of the ummah today, and you look at how they are earning money, today everything is about money. People will sell their parents, they will sell their children, their brothers and sisters just to get a few rands. Where did they get this from? Haram income, somewhere down the line. Contamination, somewhere down the line. It's like a swine flu. May Allah protect us. And it is something so serious that no matter how much we speak about it, it will not be enough. We need to make sure that we are earning halal and we make an effort to earn. Imagine in business, Allahu Akbar, you have a business. Your business is a brilliant halal business. You are selling that which is halal. You don't cheat. You don't deceive. The hadith speaks about those type of people and still encourages you to drop the price slightly. Make your profit margin smaller. Do you know why? The hadith says there'll be more baraka because you're helping more people. Rahimallahu imri'in Samhan idha ba'a Samhan idha shtara Allah will have mercy upon a buyer who is considerate of the seller when selling or when buying. Allah will have mercy upon a seller who is considerate of the buyer when he is selling. And a buyer who is considerate of the seller when buying. Each one is trying to make sure that the other one goes away saying this was a good deal. They give you dua. That dua with a small amount is better than a big amount where people go back with the goods. I'm not saying it's haram, but it's void of the mercy. Allah's dua is not exactly on that. In the sense that something is for hundred rands and you sell it for a thousand rands to a person who's rich. No problem. The deal might be halal if they are both parties are happy. But... What might happen is the person might curse you later on. Something might go wrong with that item and he says, look, this man ripped me off. Even if they say it once, one day he might pass another supermarket, another store. And he says, I bought it for a thousand here. It's for 200 rands. He says, no, that man, Allah must fix him up. That dua is enough to destroy your children. Believe me, may Allah protect us. Why do we want that? We are Muslims. We must be business people who are upright. Who think of the others, not only ourselves. Don't worry. You don't have to drive the Mercedes and everything like the Joneses. May Allah protect us. We need baraka. We need happiness. Even if we are having little 1960 old vehicles. May Allah protect us. No problem. We ask Allah's baraka and mercy. And this is why we need to go back to our roots and see where we come from. We are Muslimin. We are, we are a, an ummah that is not supposed to be greedy. We are an ummah that is only supposed to be greedy for spirituality. Whenever there is a good deed, we need to go there. Why can't we think the same way we think for business, for our deen? Business dealing, we sit and we think anything. I want to do this. I want to do that. Yes, let me do that. Let me convince this man to do that. Let me convince him to come and meet me. Let me try and sell this to him. Sell that to him. You have a lecture in your masjid. Try and sell it to your children, your own children. Become a salesman for the sake of Allah. You have, for example, an Islamic program, whether it is on any form of media, something beneficial, sell it to your own kids to start off with. Then sell it to your friends and tell Allah, Ya Allah, help me and to, to be from amongst those who becomes very, very passionate when it comes to my religion. In the true sense. And let's do something about it. A talk of this nature really should make me think and ponder over the depth of this issue. Because believe me, when we get to the Quran, one is you read about halal and haram. But secondly, derive from the Quran and the Sunnah lessons as to what the effects are of eating haram. What happens? And today I've shown you very little. To be honest with you, it's a tip of the iceberg. What happens? If you sit properly, it will really make you scared and worried. Look at the condition of the ummah. What's going on? And then ask yourself, what's happening to the Muslims? Everyone who's got money, they want to rush to do deals in Dubai and here and there. We are not saying that's haram, 
But ask the ulama, what you're engaging in, is it permissible or not? Half the time it's not even allowed. And we don't even know. Half the time there is a clean cut hadith which tells you that the particular item you are trying to achieve is completely prohibited. And we don't even know. So it's important we get advice and we know what's halal and haram. Where are we working? How are we getting money? This is what the Prophet wasallam says. He speaks about the people who are buying and selling. And he says, if they are truthful and make everything clear, فَإِن صَدَقَ وَبَيَّنَا بُورِكَ لَهُمَا فِي بَيْعِهِمَا if they are honest and open and truthful and they don't hide anything from the party who is buying, then Allah will grant barakah for both of them. You got a car, you are selling it. Don't say, look, foot stoots. Yes, that's a way of doing it. But tell them, listen, brother, I just changed the clutch plate here. And you know, I had a problem with the radiator. But otherwise, it's a brilliant car. Mashallah, this is the price I want. Wallahi, the day they find those two problems, they will think to themselves, I was warned about it. But you lied. They drove it away, they paid you, and then something goes wrong and they are stuck on the M5. They begin to curse you. Hey, this man cheated me. May Allah fix him up. That's enough. You're destroyed. That is why the, the same hadith carries on and it says, Wa in kathaba wa katama muhiqat baraka tu bay'ihima. Allahu Akbar. If they lie to each other and they keep things away from each other regarding the deal, and then they struck a deal. Allah snatches away the barakah from that deal. Gone. Subhanallah. We are Muslims. This deen is powerful. If we follow this deen properly, Wallahi, I tell you, the world will accept Islam. How did Islam go into Southeast Asia, Indonesia and those countries? Wallahi, through upright business people, look at what happened to them. When their income was halal, when their mannerisms and etiquettes were proper, when they were following the sunnah, they did not have to tell people except Islam, like what we do today. They just had to deal with them. When people saw that these people are so straight, the man is selling me something and telling me how bad that item is. Allahu Akbar. He sells you dates and he says, look, these are a little bit rotten. You, bet you might get a smell here at the back. Allahu Akbar. The bottom of the bag, you might get a smell. They look shocked. What? This man is telling me what's wrong with his dates. If it was someone else, he would have just put the good dates at the top. You come out, you see, hey, mashallah, very nice. Give me the whole bag. You take the bag, the first layer is good, the rest of it is bad. A lot of people do do this. You want to sell your car, first thing you do, valet. What does a valet do? It's a cosmetic action. It clears the outside of the car. The engine is what is more important. You can have an upside down wheelbarrow, but if that thing is going to last, Alhamdulillah, that is the purpose of the mode of transport being achieved. May Allah protect us. So the hadith says, we will snatch away the barakah from a deal that is halal. The item purchased and sold was halal, but there was deceiving in it. What type of deceiving? You didn't tell them what was wrong and you knew something that was wrong. You're selling a house and you didn't tell them about the burst pipes or about how old the structure is and there's some very big flaw, very big flaw, very big mistake when it comes to the architecture of the house and it's about to collapse. The architects have given it only two years and mashallah, you're collecting three million rands for the house. What type of barak are you going to have? Where are you going to spend that money? The next house you buy with it, it will be cursed from the beginning to the end. May Allah protect us. Why? The money you got was through deceiving someone else. Two years down the line when the cracks begin to appear in that previous house, what will happen? They will curse you from the beginning to the end. Wallahi, if you could, you would go back to them and give them six million rands to say, please withdraw that dua, the evil dua that you made against me. Please, I've seen so much evil in my life. Why? We are spiritual people. We don't want to see that type of a mess in our lives. Don't we want happiness and joy? Why are marriages breaking left, right and center? A lot of it is to do with income. The very walima, the walima itself. Let me explain to you. And we are not being too hard and strict. Wallahi, a spade is a spade. As I said last night, we will call a spade a spade. We do not call it a big spoon. No, even if it looks like one. When we have a walima, what are we doing? We are celebrating half of our iman. That's much more than salah. One salah is not half of your iman. One salah is a portion. 
But we are celebrating half of our Iman and the function, subhanallah, the women are dressed as though they've come to a nightclub to celebrate half of your Iman. What type of barakah do you want in your children who are resultant from that walima? May Allah forgive us. I told you it's never too late because some of us must be scratching our heads and saying, hey, I had a function just like that. It's not too late. Engage in tawbah. Engage in tawbah and Allah will forgive you. And inshallah, try and work on your children now. If you've already got children, if you don't really have them yet, you are lucky. May Allah protect us. That is the depth of it. And I know it's something very, very sensitive that I've just said. Because the issue of halal income needs to be spoken about. Many people are just throwing in the money and they just enslave themselves for the rand and the dollar and so on. This person sees a US dollar, there is a different cord that is struck in his belly and he wants it by hook or crook. May Allah protect us. Why? It's called a green back. Allahu Akbar. It will make your back green as well. Yes, that's what's going on today. So we need to understand if that walima is to be done, treat it as though it is definitely what it is. And what is that? Celebration of half of your iman. Have the Quran, have a sheikh, have an alim, separate your crowd, have people who are told that please write it in your card, please dress Islamically. We are celebrating half of our iman. I, I still would like to see that happening. I would like to see one card of a wedding where they are saying there for the walima, please dress in proper Islamic garb. We are celebrating half of our Iman. We would like Barakah. So many people, they, they email me and they tell me, you know, we'd like to write a nice caption on our wedding card. Please give us a, a, a bit of a guideline as to what to put. When you tell them this, they've never ever done it. Not one. Why? Tell them it's half of your Iman. Wallahi, may I, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make myself and yourselves more conscious of how we treat these walimas. I was about to say, don't worry. If you didn't do it in the first walima, you can do it in the second. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, I don't want to open a can of worms. Really. Because the men will be laughing and the women will be weeping. What is this man trying to achieve? So let's not say that. You know, that's a way of doing it. You say it and then you say, let's not say it. So you've given your message, but then you quickly delete it. Like they say with Gmail now, after you've sent your mail, you have an option for a few seconds to actually get it back. May Allah protect us. It's a quick way of doing things. So the reality is, inshallah, I hope to close on this note, food for thought for myself before everybody else. Even if one of us, even if one of us is impacted by what was said this evening, and has to make one change in his or her life. Inshallah, we've achieved. May Allah make this gathering a blessed gathering. We have spoken solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only to utter the truth, inshallah. And believe me, if I have uttered words that may have sounded, sounded a little bit harsh, that is from me and from shaitan. The method used by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was very calm and relaxed. But sometimes he raised his voice. When it was a very important issue to me, when Allah tells you and me that a person who eats haram is similar to a person who is possessed in behavior, then that makes me worried. And when we read the verse, the problem is the rest of the ummah don't understand the Arabic language. And we sit and we read it. Do you know what Allah says in the Quran? Regarding abstaining from eating haram, Allah says, if you want to carry on eating that type of haram, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ If you are not going to abstain from eating haram and from usury and interest and, and what have you, then you should know that war is announced against you by Allah and His Messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to myself and yourselves. مَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغِ وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد سبحان الله وبحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب